Making America, Chapter 13, Sectional Conflict and Shattered Union, 1840 to 1860. This is going to cover the run-up to the Civil War, and it's going to leave us just before war breaks out. Individual choices, Frederick Douglass. In 1838, Frederick Douglass, a slave living in Baltimore, decided that he would try to escape. This was no sudden impulse. Douglass had been thinking about freedom for most of his life. As a young boy, he told his white friends, you will be free as soon as you are 21, but I am a slave for life. And he had tried once before to make his way to freedom, but was captured and returned to his owner. Though his master threatened to sell him to a cotton plantation in Alabama, Douglas's intelligence and skills were worth more in Baltimore. He was made an apprentice at the local shipyard, eventually becoming a master ship caulker. His productivity earned him a lot of freedom. He made his own contracts, set his own work schedule, and collected his own earnings. I was now of some importance to my master, Douglas recalled. I was bringing him from six to seven dollars per week. But he also remembered his liberty. I have observed this in my experience of slavery, Douglas commented, that whenever my condition was improved, instead of its increasing my contentment, it only increased my desire to be free. Using a wide network of personal connections, Douglas raised money and secured forged documents that entitled him to pass unmolested through slave territory. On September 3rd, Douglas disguised himself as a merchant sailor and made his way northward, arriving in New York City early on the morning of September 4th. Although he had a couple of close calls, Douglas's escape had succeeded. Douglas was now free, but the promised land of the non-slave North proved disappointing. Moving to the town of New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he hoped to earn a living in the boatyards, Douglas found that such was the strength of prejudice against color among the white caulkers that they refused to work with me, and of course I could get no employment. For three years, he was forced to do odd jobs to keep himself and his wife alive. There was no work too hard, none too dirty, he recalled. Despite this decline in status and earnings, Douglas never regretted his choice of freedom, and when he attended an anti-slavery conference in Nantucket, Douglas stood to speak about his experiences. When famed abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison heard Douglas, he was so moved that he offered to support Douglas as a lecturer in the anti-slavery cause. Having experienced both slavery in the South and racial discrimination in the North, Douglas chose to speak out for the cause of racial equality for the next 50 years. See this chapter's individual voices feature for an example of his speaking style. Though not a politician, Frederick Douglass certainly was not immune to the political wrangling going on around him. Like many Americans, Douglass's life was in a state of constant upheaval as politicians engaged in abstract power games that had all too real consequences. Struggles over tariffs, coinage, internal improvements, public land policy, and dozens of other practical issues intersected in complicated ways with the overinflated egos of power-hungry politicians to create an air of political contention and national crisis. And in the midst of it all, a war with neighboring Mexico brought even more contention and a huge tract of new land into the mix, land that seemed veined with gold, adding greed to the equation. Then, strong-willed men such as Jefferson Davis and Stephen A. Douglas threw more fuel on the fire as they fought over the best, that is, the most profitable and politically advantageous, route for a transcontinental railroad that would tie this new wealth to the rest of the nation. Railroads are going to be very important coming up, folks. The halls of Congress rang with debate, denunciation, and even physical violence like the caning of Sumner. Tangled in it all lurked an institution that Frederick Douglass knew all too well, slavery. In a changing society ripe with the problems of expansion, immigration, industrialization, and urbanization, political leaders tried either to seek compromise or to ignore the slavery question altogether. In reality, they could do neither. As the confrontation between Northern and Southern societies peaked, many people wanted peace and favored reconciliation. Ultimately, however, both sides rejected compromise, leading to America's most destructive and deadly war. New political options. Concerning the questions, how did the politicization of slavery in the 1840s begin to move the nation toward crisis? And how did the war with Mexico and its outcomes influence politics? The presidential elections in 1840 and 1844 had put American expansion at the heart of political debate. While all could affirm the existence of manifest destiny, there was significant disagreement about exactly what form it should take. The political system held together during these years, but the successes enjoyed by third party challengers, challenges were evident that significant problems churned under the surface. It was clear to many that the nation's political system was not meeting their economic and ideological needs, and they began looking for new options. Politicizing slavery in the 1840s, that means making it a big political issue. Anti-slavery sentiments were still not widespread among the American people during the 1840s. However, abolitionist voices were getting more politically insistent. Despite strong and sometimes violent opposition, the abolition movement had continued to grow, especially among the privileged and educated classes in the Northeast. This is also during the Second Great Awakening. 
But the leading voice among the abolitionists, William Lloyd Garrison, consistently alienated his followers. Calling the Constitution a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, Garrison burned a copy of it, telling his followers, so perish all compromises with tyranny. He's probably thinking they're the three-fifths compromise. And he urged them to have no dealings with a government that permitted so great an evil as slavery. Citing the reluctance of most organized churches to condemn slavery outright, Garrison urged his followers to break with them as well. He also offended many of his white evangelical supporters by associating with and supporting free black advocates of abolition. During the 1830s, even moderates within the abolition movement had celebrated Frederick Douglass and other African-American abolitionists, welcoming them as members of the American Anti-Slavery Society. But more insistent black voices frightened white abolitionists. African-American abolitionist David Walker cried, the whites want slaves and want us for their slaves, but some of them even will curse the day they ever saw us. Walker advocated that African-Americans should kill or be killed. Another black spokesman, Henry Highland Garnet, proclaimed, strike for your lives and liberties, rather die free men than live to be slaves. Garrison sentiments mobilized some, but most of his followers were more conservative. In 1840, this and other controversial issues caused many of those moderates to bolt from Garrison's American Anti-Slavery Society to form the more temperate American and Foreign Anti-Slavery Society. This new group forged strong ties with mainstream politicians and church leaders who, while opposed to any extension of slavery and sympathetic to moderate abolitionist proposals, had been relatively silent because of Garrison's perceived radicalism. Efforts by moderate anti-slavery supporters meshed with the political aspirations of both those who opposed slavery's expansion primarily for political and economic reasons and those who were motivated by purely ethical concerns. Moderates in 1840 challenged both Whig and Democratic ambivalence by forming the Liberty Party. Specifically disavowing Garrison's drastic aims, Liberty Party leaders argued that slavery would eventually die on its own if it could be confined geographically. In addition, the Liberty Party called for the abolition of slavery in Washington, D.C. and in all the territories where it already existed. Though certainly more popular than Garrison's appeals, this moderate message drew little open political support. In 1840, Liberty Party presidential candidate James G. Bernie garnered only about 7,000 votes. But in 1844, when he again ran on the Liberty Party ticket, he won 62,000 popular votes. Clearly, a moderate anti-slavery position was becoming more acceptable. And to read the excerpt on 310, while white abolitionists such as William Lloyd Garrison crafted moral arguments against slavery, African Americans were making a much more direct and emotional appeal. This 1848 publication contained a copy of David Walker's 1829 Appeal to the Colored Citizens of the World, a call for free and enslaved people to rise up, along with the biography of Walker by another noted African American abolitionist, uh, Henry Highland Garnet, with his appeal to slaves to act for their freedom. Opting for war with Mexico. With the Oregon Agreement and the annexation of Texas in place, the nation's border issues were now settled from Congress's point of view, but Mexico had a completely different outlook. Mexico had never ratified the Treaty of Velasco ending the Texas Revolution, so Texas's southern border remained in dispute. President Polk wanted a war with Mexico to unify his party and hopefully give the Democrats an electoral edge based on patriotism. Seeking to push Mexico into a fight, the president dispatched John Slidell to Mexico City late in 1845, instructing him to pressure the Mexicans to sell New Mexico and California, in addition to accepting the Rio Grande River as the border with Texas. At the same time, Polk dispatched American troops to Louisiana, ready to strike if Mexico refused Slidell's offer. He also notified Americans in California that if war broke out, the Pacific Fleet would seize California ports and support an insurrection against Mexican authority. Polk is really advocating for war here, folks. Nervous but bristling over what seemed to be preparations for war, the Mexican government refused to receive Slidell. Polk then ordered Zachary Taylor to re lead troops from New Orleans toward the Rio Grande. Shortly thereafter, an American military party led by John C. Fremont entered California's Salinas Valley. Reaching an end to his patience, on April 22, 1846, Mexico proclaimed that its territory had been violated and declared war. Two days later, Mexican troops engaged in a detachment of Taylor's army at Rancho Carasitos on the Rio Grande. Skirmishing continued until May 8th when the first major battle between Mexican and American forces took place at Palo Alto. When news of the battle reached Washington, Polk immediately called for war. Although the nation was far from united on the issue, Congress agreed on May 13, 1846. And that's how the Mexican-American War starts. Polk basically ordered US troops into disputed territory and then declared war when the Mexicans, you know, attacked the troops that they found. The outbreak of war disturbed many Americans. In New England, protests ran high. 
It was not expansion as such the troubled Northeasterners, but the potential that annexing so much land south of the Missouri Compromise Line would expand slavery and embolden Southern political agendas. Since the Missouri Compromise, some Northerners had come to believe that a slaveholding oligarchy controlled life and politics in the South. Abolitionists warned that this slave power sought to expand its reach until it controlled every aspect of American life. Many viewed Congress's adoption of the gag rule in 1836, which automatically tabled anti-slavery petitions, and the drive to annex Texas as evidence of the slave power's influence. Serious political combat began in August of 1846 when David Wilmot, a Democratic representative from Pennsylvania, proposed an amendment to the War Appropriations Bill saying that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any territory gained in the war with Mexico. The Wilmot Proviso twice passed in the House of Representatives, but both times failed in the Senate, where equal state representation gave the South a stronger position. The House finally decided in April to appropriate money for the war without stipulating whether or not slavery would be permitted. While all this political infighting was going on in Washington, D.C., a real war was going on in the Southwest. In California, American settlers rallied in open rebellion in the Sacramento Valley and declared independence in June of 1846. They crafted a flag depicting a grizzly bear and announced the birth of the Bear Flag Republic. Fremont's force rushed to join the Bear Flag Rebels, and when the Little Army arrived in Monterey on July 19th, they found that the Pacific Fleet had already acted on Polk's orders and seized the city. The Mexican forces were in full flight southward. To round out the greater Southwestern strategy, on May 15th, Polk ordered Colonel Stephen Kearney to invade New Mexico. After leading his men across 800 miles of desert to Santa Fe, Kearney found a less than hostile enemy. Members of the interracial upper class of Santa Fe had already expressed interest in joining the United States, and given the opportunity, they surrendered without firing a single shot. Within a short time, all of the New Mexico region and California were securely in the hands of U.S. forces. In Texas, however, Zachary Taylor faced more serious opposition. Marching across the Rio Grande, Taylor headed for the regional capital of Monterey, capturing the city in September of 1846. Because of his military successes, Taylor became a political threat to Polk within the party. In an attempt to undermine Taylor's political appeal, Polk turned the war effort over to Winfield Scott, old fuss and feathers is his nickname, ordering him to gather an army, drawing men from Taylor's and other forces, and sail to Veracruz. From there, the army was to move inland to take Mexico City. Planning to crush Taylor's remaining force and then wheel around to attack Scott, General Santa Ana and his numerically superior army encountered Taylor at Buena Vista in February of 1847. Tired and dispirited from a forced march across the desert, the Mexican army was in no shape to fight, but Santa Ana ordered an attack anyways. Tactically speaking, the Battle of Buena Vista was a draw, but it was a strategic victory for the Americans. Taylor's fresher troops stalled Santa Ana's forces, permitting Scott's army to capture Veracruz on March 9th. Marching and fighting their way to Mexico City, Scott's force captured it on September 13, 1847. With Mexico City, all of Texas, New Mexico, and California in American hands, the direction of treaty talks should have been fairly predictable. Scott's enormous success, however, caused the Mexican government's collapse, leaving nobody left in power to negotiate with. The Mexican government finally elected a new president, and finally, on February 2nd, 1848, the Mexican delegation signed the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, granting the United States all the territory between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande, and between there and the Pacific Ocean. In exchange, American envoy Nicholas Trist agreed that the United States would pay Mexico $15 million and would pay any war reparations owed to Americans. War reparations, by the way, are payments made to settle damage and injury claims resulting from a war, and usually they're paid by the losing side. Polk was very angry when he heard the terms of the treaty, believing that the sweeping American victory justified annexing all of Mexico. He wants all of Mexico. In Congress, however, many anti-slavery voices protested bringing so much potential slave territory into the Union. Others opposed the annexation because they feared that Mexico's largely Roman Catholic population might be a threat to Protestant institutions in the United States. Still others, many of whom had opposed the war to begin with, had moral objections to taking any territory by force. Perhaps more convincing than any of these arguments, however, was that the war had cost a lot of money and congressmen were unwilling to allocate more if peace was within reach. With these considerations in mind, the Senate approved the treaty by a vote of 38 to 14. No sooner had California been acquired than its value increased significantly. 
In 1848, a group of laborers digging in a mill race for John Sutter in Northern California found flakes and then chunks of gold. Despite efforts to suppress the news, by September, information had reached the East that the light work of panning for gold in California could yield $50 a day or two months' wages for an average Northern working man. In 1849, more than 100,000 49ers, you know, people who were going to California after the discovery of gold, took up residence in California. And the question of getting that gold back to financial centers in the East would almost immediately become another political controversy. We're going to be talking about the railroads with that. The election of 1848. The American victory in the war with Mexico was an enormous shot in the arm for American nationalism and manifest destiny, but it also brought the divisive issue of slavery back into mainstream politics. Suffering from ill health, Polk chose not to run for a second term in 1848, leaving the Democrats scrambling for a candidate. They chose Lewis Cass of Michigan, a longtime moderate on slavery issues, as their presidential candidate and balanced the ticket with General William Butler of Kentucky. The Whigs hoped to ride a wave of nationalism following the war with Mexico by running military hero Zachary Taylor, a Louisianan and a slaveholder, for president, with moderate New Yorker Millard Fillmore for vice president. Not satisfied with either party's candidates, a number of anti-slavery advocates banded together to launch yet another third party called the Free Soil Party. They promoted Martin Van Buren as its candidate. Van Buren had only served one term as president, so he would you know, still be eligible. Um, at this point in time, it's worth noting that there is no amendment limiting the president to only serving two terms. At this point, it's really only tradition that limits people from not running for a third term. Adopting the slogan, free soil, free speech, free labor, and free men, this new coalition, the Free Soil Party, avoided taking a radical stand on the issue of slavery itself, but was firm about excluding slavery from the territories. When all the votes were counted, Taylor came out the winner with Cass a very close second, but the Free Soilers netted nearly 10% of all votes cast, which is nothing to sneeze at for a third party. Disaffected voices and political dissent. It did not take long after the election of 1848 for cracks in the system to become more prominent. In an effort to compete with Democrats in Northeastern cities, the Whigs had tried to win Catholic and immigrant voters away from the rival party. The strategy backfired. Not only did the Whigs not attract large numbers of immigrants, but they also alienated two core groups among their existing supporters, artisans who saw immigrants as the main source of their economic and social woes, and Protestant evangelicals to whom Roman Catholic, Irish, and German immigrants symbolized all that was threatening to the American Republic. Whig leaders could do little to address these voters' immediate concerns, and increasing numbers left the Whig party to form state and local coalitions more in tune with their hopes and fears. One of the most prominent of these locally oriented groups was an anti-Catholic, anti-immigrant group that sprang up in New York but soon spread nationally. Bearing close ties in terms of both leadership and attitudes to the anti-Masons, this closely knit political network grafted xenophobic meaning fearful of or hateful toward foreign or for, bleh, foreigners or those seen as being different, grafted xenophobic views onto strong anti-party sentiments, alleging wholesale voter fraud and government corruption by both major parties. They insisted that debates over slavery were being advanced by both Northern and Southern elites to divert ordinary Americans away from the real issues of immigration, loss of job security, urban crowding and violence, and political corruption. Seeking to protect their members from this elite conspiracy, leaders told them to say, I know nothing, if they were questioned about the organization or its political intrigues, hence their name, the Know Nothings. That literally is the name of their party, the Know Nothings. Increasingly after 1848, these secretive groups became more public and more vocal, promoting a 21 year naturalization period, meaning you couldn't become a citizen if you immigrate until after a period of 21 years, a ban against naturalized citizens holding public office, and the use of the Protestant Bible in public schools. As future president Rutherford B. Hayes noted, these people were expressing a general disgust with the powers that be. New political realities in the 1850s. Considering the questions, what new political options affected the political system during the 1850s? In what ways? And in what ways did economic development such as railroads contribute to political instability? As any decade dawned, developments during the previous 10 years continued to destabilize politics as the overinflated egos of power-hungry politicians mixed with very real structural issues to create a new set of political realities and a hot house environment being increasingly fired up by debates over slavery. 
The fate of the nation hung in the balance as various interests vied for control and pushed the country ever closer to crisis. The politics of compromise. While dissidents of various types attacked the political parties from outside, problems raised by national expansion were continuing to erode party unity from within. Immediately after Zachary Taylor's election in 1848, California's future became a new divisive issue. California presented a peculiar political problem. Once word reached the rest of the nation that California was rich with gold, politicians immediately began grasping for control over the newly acquired territory. Although large parts of the area lay below the 3630 line that the Missouri Compromise had set for slavery expansion, that legislation had applied only to territory acquired in the Louisiana Purchase, there's a loophole there, and the failure of Congress to pass Wilmot's Proviso left the question of slavery in the new territories wide open. Having been primarily responsible for crafting the Missouri Compromise, Henry Clay took it upon himself to find a solution and he proposed a complex omnibus bill, meaning a piece of legislation with many parts. He proposed it to the Senate on January 20th of 1850. According to this bill, California would enter the union as a free state, but the slavery question would be left to popular sovereignty in all other territories acquired through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The bill also directed Texas to drop a continuing border dispute with New Mexico in exchange for assumption of Texas's public debt. Then, to appease abolitionists, Clay called for an end to the slave trade in Washington, D.C., and balanced that with a clause popular with Southerners but absolutely hated by Northerners, a new, more effective fugitive slave law. Can you see why he's called the Great Compromiser? Although Clay was trying to please all sectional interests, the omnibus bill satisf satisfied no one. Congress debated it without resolution for seven whole months. Finally, in July of 1850, Clay's proposals were defeated. The 73-year-old political veteran left the Capitol tired and dispirited, but Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois set himself to the task of reviving the compromise. Using practical economic arguments and backroom political arm twisting, Douglas proposed each component of Clay's omnibus package as a separate bill, steering it forward toward a more comprehensive compromise. Finally, in September, Congress passed the Compromise of 1850. The Compromise of 1850 did little to relieve underlying sectional differ regional differences and only aggravated political dissent. That slave owners could pursue runaway slaves into northern states and return them into bondage brought slavery way too close to home for many northerners that's talking about the fugitive slave law. Throughout the 1850s, both white and African American activists, like Harriet Tubman, who you've probably heard of, sought to evade the law by conducting escaped slaves to Canada through a covert network of hiding places called the Underground Railroad. Southerners, too, had no reason to celebrate the admission of another non-slave state, talking about California there, which further drained their power in Congress, while giving them no positive protection for slavery in either the territories or at home. Still, the compromise created a brief respite from the slavery extension question at a time when the nation's attention increasingly needed to focus on other major changes in national life. A changing political economy. In the years following the Compromise of 1850, American economic and territorial growth continued to play a destabilizing role in both national and regional development. Most notably during the 1850s, industrial growth accelerated, further altering the nation's economic structure. By 1860, less than half of all Northern workers made a living from agriculture as Northern industry became more concentrated. Steam began to replace water as the primary power source and factories were no longer limited to locations along rivers. The use of interchangeable parts became more sophisticated and intricate. In 1851, for example, Isaac Singer devised an assembly line using this technology and began to mass produce sewing machines, fostering a boom in ready-made clothing. Some of you might even still have Singer sewing machines at home. I know that I sure did growing up. As industry expanded, the North became more reliant on the West and South for raw materials and for the food consumed by those working in Northeastern factories. Railroad development stimulated economic and industrial growth. Between 1850 and 1860, the number of miles of track in the U.S. increased from 9,000 to more than 30,000. In 1852, the Michigan Southern Railroad completed the first line to Chicago from the east, and by 1855, the city had become a key transportation hub linking regions farther west with the eastern seaboard. Developing this transportation system was difficult. A lack of bridges and a standard rail gauge, rail gauge of course meaning the distance between train tracks, at least 12 different rail gauges were used, meant that cargoes frequently had to be transferred from one rail line to another. 
Despite these problems, railroads quickly became an integral part of the expanding American economy. Western farmers who had previously shipped their products downriver to New Orleans now sent them much more rapidly by rail to Eastern industrial centers. The availability of reliable transportation induced farmers, um, encouraged farmers to cultivate more land and enterprising individuals started up rela uh, related businesses such as warehouses and grain elevators, simplifying storage and loading along railroad lines. Mining boomed, particularly the iron industry. The railroads not only transported ore, but also became a prime consumer. Building a railroad required huge sums of money. In populous areas where passenger and freight traffic was heavy, the promise of a quick and profitable return on investment allowed railroads to raise sufficient capital by selling company stock. In sparsely settled regions, however, where investment returns were much slower, state and local governments loaned money directly to rail companies, financed them indirectly by purchasing stock or extended state tax exemptions. The most crucial aid to railroads, however, was federal land grants. This is a big deal, folks. The federal government, which owned vast amounts of unsettled territory, gave land to railroad developers who then could lease or sell plots along the proposed route to finance construction. In 1850, Stephen A. Douglas netted a 2.6 million acre land grant to Illinois, Mississippi, and Alabama for a railroad between Chicago and Mobile. Congress also invested heavily in plans for a transcontinental railroad and on March 4th, 1853, appropriated $150,000 to survey potential routes across the continent. While Americans were enjoying the rail boom, crop failures throughout Europe were creating new markets for American produce. During the 1850s, the price of grain rose sharply in world markets. Railroads allowed Western farmers to ship directly to Eastern seaports and onto Europe. Meanwhile, technological advances in farming equipment enabled American farmers to harvest enough grain to meet world demand. Using the steel plow devised in 1837 by John Deere, farmers could cultivate more acres with greater ease. The mechanical reaper invented in 1831 by Cyrus McCormick allowed a single operator to harvest as much as 14 field hands could. The combination of greater production potential and speedy transportation prompted Westerners to increase farm size and concentrate on cash crops. The outcome of these developments was a vast increase in the economic and political power of the West. Western grain markets provided the foodstuffs for American industrialization, but as noted in chapter 11, Europe provided much of the labor. Total immigration to the US exceeded 100,000 people for the first time in 1848, and by 1851, 221,000 people migrated the, to the US from Ireland alone. In 1852, the number of German immigrants reached 145,000 people. Many of these newcomers were not trained in skilled crafts and wound up settling in the industrial urban centers of the Northeast, where they could find work in the factories. As a side note, they tend to be called the old immigrants and they will be contrasted with new immigrants who will come in and around uh, 1890. This combination of changes set the stage for political crisis. Liberalized suffrage rules transformed naturalized immigrants into voters and both parties courted them, adding their interests to the political pot, meaning they're trying to attract votes of, of, from immigrants. Meanwhile, a mechanized tex textile industry, hungry for Southern fiber, lent vitality to the continued growth of the cotton kingdom and the slave labor system that gave it life. Northern political leaders visualized an industrial nation based on free labor, but that view ran counter to the Southern elites' ideals of agrarian capitalism based on slavery. In the West, most continued to believe in the Jeffersonian, Jeffersonian ideal of an agricultural nation of small and medium-sized farms and could not accept either industrial or cotton capitalism as positive developments. Political instability in the election of 1852. Dynamic economic progress improved material life throughout the nation, but it also raised serious questions about what course progress should take. As one clear-sighted Northern minister pointed out in 1852, the debate was not about whether America should pursue progress, but about different kinds and methods of progress. Contradictory visions of national destiny were about to cause the breakdown of the existing party system. Slavery seemed to loom behind every debate, but most Americans, even Southerners, had no personal investment in the institution. Two thirds of Southerners owned no slaves, tolerating the institution, but having only fleeting contact with the great plantations and their peculiar labor system. Northerners too were largely indifferent. 
men like young Illinois uh, state Congressman Abraham Lincoln believed the institution was wrong, but it was not inclined to do anything about it. What mattered to these people was not slavery, but autonomy, control over local affairs and over their own lives. The slavery question challenged notions of autonomy in both the North and the South. In their widely disseminated rhetoric, abolitionists expanded the specter of the slave power conspiracy, especially in the aftermath of the Compromise of 1850. Growing numbers perceived this conspiracy as intent on imposing Southern ways and installing Southern elites or their sympathizers in seats of power in every section of the nation. Whether farmers in Illinois or artisans in Pennsylvania, common people stood ready to resist a Southern takeover of local institutions. Likewise, common people in the South feared interference from outsiders in view of the ever more vigorous anti-Southern crusade by Northern activists and abolitionists. After the Compromise of 1850 momentarily eased regional fears, sectional tensions flamed anew in 1852 with the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Stowe portrayed the darkest inhumanities of Southern slavery in the first American novel to include African Americans as central characters. Uncle Tom's Cabin sold 300,000 copies in its first year. Adapted for the stage, it became one of the most popular plays of the period. The book stirred public opinion and breathed new life into anti-slavery sentiments, leading free soilers and so-called conscience Whigs to renew their efforts to limit or end slavery. When these activists saw that the Whig party was incapable of addressing the slavery question in any effective way, they began to look for other political options. Superficially, the Whigs seemed well organized and surprisingly unified as a new presidential election loomed in 1852. Zachary Taylor had died in office in July 1850. He ate some bad fruit and milk and died. Uh, and they nominated General Winfield Scott, Taylor's rival for fame in the war with Mexico. The Democrats remained divided throughout 49 ballots, unable to decide among Lewis Cass of Michigan, Stephen A. Douglas of Illinois, and James Buchanan of Pennsylvania. They finally settled on the virtually unknown Franklin Pierce of New Hampshire, who pledged to uphold the Compromise of 1850 and to keep slavery out of politics. This promise was enough to bring Martin Van Buren back into the Democrats, and he brought many free soilers back with him. Many others, though, abandoned Van Buren and joined forces with conscience Whigs. Scott was a national figure and a distinguished military hero, but Pierce gathered 254 electoral votes to Scott's 42, exposing the disarray in the Whig party. Splits between cotton and conscience groups splintered Whig unity and regional tensions escalated as free soil rhetoric clashed with calls for extending slavery. Confrontations between Catholics and Protestants and between native born and immigrant laborers caused bitter animosity. In the North where immigration, industrialization and anti-slavery sentiment were most prevalent, and economic friction most pronounced, massive numbers of voters, believing the Whigs incapable of addressing current problems, deserted the Whig party. By the way, there are several images here on pages 318 and 319 that would be wonderful for you to take a look at. So if you've got the book, you might pause it here, take it out and uh, take a look at those pages. Increasing tension under Pierce. The Democratic Party and Franklin Pierce also felt the pressures of a changing electorate. Pierce was part of the Young America Movement, which, as a whole, tried to ignore the slavery issue, advocating romantic and aggressive nationalism, manifest destiny, and Republican revolutions throughout the Americas. In line with the Young America agenda, Pierce emphasized expansion. Choosing a route for transcontinental railroads became a, the keystone in his agenda for the nation. Southerners knew that a railroad based in the South would channel the flow of gold from California through their region and would also allow new settlement and cotton agriculture to spread beyond the waterways that had proved necessary for expansion so far. Eventually, the new territories would become states, increasing the South's national political power. That model of development was totally unacceptable to several groups. To Northern evangelicals such as Sojourner Truth, who viewed slavery as a moral blight on the nation, to free soil advocates who believed the spread of slavery would degrade white workers and to, uh, to Northern manufacturers who wanted to maintain dominance in Congress to ensure continued economic protection. In May, 1853, only two months after assuming office, Pearson flamed all of these groups by sending James Gadsden, a Southern railroad developer to Mexico in order to purchase a strip of land lying below the Southern border of the New Mexico territory. Any rail line built westward from a southern city to California would have to cross that land, and Pierce and his southern supporters wanted to make sure it was part of the U.S. The Gadsden Purchase, signed on December 30, 1853, added 29,640 square miles of land to the U.S. for a cost of $10 million. It also finalized the southwestern border of the United States. 
With the Gadsden Purchase, by the way, the 48 contiguous states, the states that um, all touch, that would be complete. They're not all states yet, though. The Gadsden Purchase prompted proponents of a southern route for the Transcontinental Railroad, led by Secretary of War Jefferson Davis, to push for government sponsorship of the project. Having invested his own money in more northerly rail development, Illinois Senator Stephen A. Douglas blocked Davis's efforts and pushed for a route westward from his hometown of Chicago. But this route would have to pass through Indian territory that was not open to rail development. To rectify this problem, to fix this problem, Douglas introduced a bill on January 4, 1854, calling for the incorporation of the entire northern half of Indian territory into a new federal entity called Nebraska. Douglas knew that he would need both northern and southern support to get his bill through Congress, and he sought to silence possible opposition by proposing that the slavery question in the territory be left to popular sovereignty, basically let the voters of Nebraska decide. When Southerners pointed out that the proposed territory was above the Missouri Compromise Line of 3630 and that Congress might prohibit popular sovereignty from functioning, Douglas responded that the Compromise of 1850 superseded or replaced the 1820 Missouri Compromise. But to calm the Southerners, he finally supported an amendment to his original bill dividing the territory in half, Nebraska in the north and Kansas in the south. The amended legislation, called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, rested on the assumption that popular sovereignty would lead to slavery in Kansas and free labor in Nebraska. Toward a house divided, considering the questions, how did various political coalitions react to the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and what was the effect of these reactions on the national political climate? Once again, slavery threatened national political stability. In the North, opponents of the bill formed local coalitions to defeat it. On January 24, 1854, a group of anti-slavery politicians, including Salmon P. Chase, Garrett Smith, Joshua Giddings, and Charles Sumner, published the appeal of the independent Democrats in Congress to the people of the United States. They called the bill an atrocious plot to make Nebraska a dreary region of despotism inhabited by masters and slaves. On February 28th, opponents of the Kansas-Nebraska bill met in Ripon, Wisconsin, and recommended the formation of a new political party. Similar meetings took place in several northern states as opposition to the bill grew. In the wake of these meetings, the existing party system collapsed and a new one arose to replace it. A shattered compromise. Despite the strong opposition, Douglas and Pierce rallied support for the Kansas-Nebraska Act. On May 26, 1854, after gaining approval in the House of Representatives, the bill passed the Senate and Pierce soon signed it into law. Passage of the act crystallized Northern anti-slavery sentiment. As Senator William Seward of New York vowed, we will engage in competition for the virgin soil of Kansas and God give the victory to the side which is stronger in numbers as it is in right. Anti-slavery forces, however, remained divided into at least three major groups. You have the free soil contingent who opposed any extension of slavery, but did not necessarily favor abolishing the institution. The other two groups, Garrisonians and Evangelicals, wanted immediate abolition, but they disagreed on many particulars. William Lloyd Garrison and his followers believed that slavery was the primary evil facing the nation, while Evangelicals agreed that slavery was evil, but believed it was one among many vices undermining the virtuous republic. All three groups constantly agitated against slavery and what they perceived as Southern control of national politics. They weakened the Democratic Party's strength in the North, but could not bring themselves to align behind a single opposition party. Actions perceived as further evidence of the slave power conspiracy also undermined democratic unity. Private armies invaded territories in Latin America and the Caribbean, which many in the North concluded were slave power efforts. In this atmosphere, President Pierce unintentionally destabilized the Democratic Party and the nation by pushing for the purchase of Cuba from Spain. When the Spanish refused, three of Pierce's European ministers met in Ostend, Belgium in October of 1854, and they secretly drafted a justification for taking Cuba by force. When the so-called Austin Manifesto became public in 1855, many Northerners were convinced that Pierce and the Democratic Party were in league with the slave power to expand slavery. These perceptions stirred anti-slavery anxieties and fueled the growth of the newly formed anti-democratic coalitions. Bleeding Kansas. Meanwhile, political friction was about to ignite Kansas. In April of 1854, abolitionist Eli Thayer of Worcester, Massachusetts organized the New England Emigrant Aid Society to encourage anti-slavery supporters to move to Kansas. They reasoned that flooding a region subject to popular sovereignty with right-minded residents would effectively save it from slavery. 
This group eventually sent 2,000 armed settlers to Kansas, founding Lawrence and other communities. With similar designs, pro-slavery Southerners, particularly those in Missouri, also encouraged settlement in the territory. Like their Northern counterparts, these Southerners came armed and ready to fight for their cause. President Pierce appointed governors in both Kansas and Nebraska and instructed them to organize elections for territorial legislatures. As pro-slavery and anti-slavery settlers vied for control of Kansas, the region became a testing ground for popular sovereignty. When the vote came on March 30, 1855, a large contingent of armed slavery supporters from Missouri crossed into Kansas and cast ballots for pro-slavery candidates. According to later Senate investigations, 60% of the votes cast were illegal. These unlawful ballots gave pro-slavery supporters a large majority in the Kansas legislature. They promptly expelled all abolitionist legislators and enacted the Kansas Code, a group of laws meant to drive all anti-slavery forces out of the territory. Anti-slavery advocates responded by organizing their own free state government and drawing up an alternative constitution which they submitted to the voters. Bloodshed soon followed. Attempting to bring the conflict to conclusion, pro-slavery territorial judge Samuel Lecomte called a grand jury of slavery supporters that indicted members of the free state government for treason and sent a posse of about 800 men to Lawrence. There, they arrested the anti-slavery forces and sacked the town. But the violence did not end there. Hearing news of the sack of Lawrence, John Brown, an anti-slavery activist, murdered five pro-slavery men living along the Pottawatomie River south of Lawrence. This Pottawatomie massacre triggered a series of episodes in which more than 200 men were killed. The Kansas issue also led to violence in Congress. During the debates over the admission of the territory, Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner made insulting remarks about South Carolina's 60-year-old Senator Andrew Butler. Butler was out of town, but Butler's nephew, Representative Preston Brooks, accosted Sumner and beat him nearly to death with a cane on the floor of Congress, by the way. Uh, He's literally sitting at his desk and gets caned. Sumner had beat him nearly to death with a cane. Uh, although, Sen or excuse me, uh, yeah, Representative Preston Brooks had accosted Sumner and beat him nearly to death with a cane. Sorry about that. The censured by the House of Representatives, Brooks was overwhelmingly reelected by his home district and openly praised for his actions. He would receive canes as gifts from admirers all over the South. Meanwhile, the presidential election of 1856 was approaching. The Pierce administration's actions, Southern expansionism, and the Kansas-Nebraska controversy swelled the ranks of dissenters like those who had convened in Ripon. Now formally calling themselves the Republican Party, these Northern and Western groups began actively seeking support. Immigration also remained a major issue, but the know-nothings, despite their success at the local and state levels, split over slavery at their initial national conventions in 1855. Many then joined Republican coalitions. John C. Fremont, a moderate abolitionist who had achieved fame as the liberator of California, won the Republican nomination. For their part, the Democrats rejected both Pierce and Douglas and nominated James Buchanan from Pennsylvania, selecting John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky as Buchanan's running mate to balance the ticket between the North and the South. The election became a contest for party survival rather than a national referendum on slavery. Buchanan received 45% of the popular vote and 163 electoral votes. Fremont finished second with 33% of the popular vote and 114 electoral votes. Know Nothing Millard Fillmore received 21% of the popular vote, but only eight electoral votes. Fremont's surprisingly narrow margin of defeat demonstrated the appeal of the newly formed Republican coalition to Northern voters. The Know Nothings disappeared and never again attempted to organize nationally. Bringing slavery home to the North. On March 4th, 1857, James Buchanan became president of the United States. The 65-year-old Pennsylvanian had begun his political career in Congress in 1821 and owed much of his success to Southern support. His election came at a time when the nation needed strong leadership, but Buchanan seemed unable to provide it. His attempt to preserve the politics of avoidance only strengthened extremism in both the North and the South. Regionalism, or loyalty to the interests of a particular region of the country, colored all political issues and every debate became a contest between competing social, political, and economic ideologies. Though Buchanan's short, uh, shortcomings contributed to the rising crisis, an event occurred within days of his inauguration that sent shockwaves through the already troubled nation. Dred Scott, a slave once owned by Army Surgeon John Emerson, sued for his freedom. Scott's attorney argued that between 1831 and 1833, Emerson had taken Scott with him during various military postings to areas where the Missouri Compromise had banned slavery, making Scott a free man. 
When, after nearly six years in the Missouri courts, the state Supreme Court rejected this argument in 1852, Scott, with the help of abolitionist lawyers, appealed to the United States Supreme Court. In a seven to two decision, the court ruled against Scott. Chief Justice Roger B. Taney, formerly a member of Andrew Jackson's kitchen cabinet and a stalwart Democrat, argued that in the eyes of the law, slaves were not people but property. As such, they could not be citizens of the United States and had no right to petition the court. Basically, you can't even bring the case. Taney then ignited a political powder keg by ruling that Congress had no constitutional authority to limit slavery in federal territories, thereby declaring the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. While Southerners generally celebrated the decision, anti-slavery forces and Northern evangelical leaders called the Dred Scott decision a mockery of justice and a crime against a higher law. Some radical abolitionists argued that the North should separate from the Union. Others suggested impeaching the Supreme Court. Already incensed by events in Kansas, anti-slavery leaders predicted that the next move by the slave power conspiracy would be to get the Supreme Court to strike down anti-slavery laws in Northern states. And now to read the special excerpt on page 323, Toward a More Perfect Union, Dred Scott v. Sanford. It is debatable whether the decision in Dred Scott v. Sanford should be discussed under a heading about a more perfect union, but as one of the most important cases ever to reach the Supreme Court, it certainly cannot be ignored. The case hinged on the question of whether a slave who resided in a territory where slavery was outlawed by an act of Congress became free as a result. In a vote of seven to two, the Supreme Court ruled that he did not. Moreover, in writing up the court's opinion, Chief Justice Roger Taney stated that due to the Fifth Amendment, Congress did not have the power to ban slavery from any territory, declaring the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional. But he went further still, ordering that because at the time the Constitution was ratified, no state recognized individuals of African descent as citizens, then rights guaranteed under the Constitution did not apply to Black people, and they were not, nor could they become, citizens of the United States. It would later take three amendments to the Constitution and a civil war to correct what Taney did with a simple stroke of a pen. Meanwhile, the Kansas issue still burned. That very few slaveholders actually moved into the territory did nothing to deter pro-slavery leaders who met in the Compton, Kansas in June 1857 to draft a state constitution favoring slavery. When the Lecompton Constitution was submitted for voters' approval, anti-slavery forces protested by refusing to vote, so it was easily ratified. But when it was revealed that more than 2,000 non-residents had voted illegally, both Republicans and Northern Democrats in Congress roundly denounced it. The state had bill passed the Senate, but the House of Representatives rejected it. The Lecompton Constitution came back to Kansas for another vote. This time, Free Soilers participated in the election and defeated the proposed constitution. Kansas would remain a territory for now. In the wider world, Kingdom of Heavenly Peace. In 1851, a visionary leader named Wang or Hung Ziu Chuan founded a movement in China called the Taiping Tian Guo, or the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace. Based on half-understood Christian tenets and other imported ideas, Hung set out to reform Chinese society by eliminating class distinctions, granting women social and economic equality with men, and eliminating foot binding, which was a crippling practice that prevented the growth of girls' feet, and instituting land reform that would distribute land equally to all. This message appealed greatly to the poorer classes, and the Taiping movement grew rapidly, alarming landowners and the ruling Qing dynasty. In 1853, Hung and a militant army of peasants captured the southern capital of Nanjing and focused on controlling China's western territories and the central Yangtze Valley. Already in disarray from foreign conflicts, the Qing dynasty met the Taiping's challenge with as much force as it could muster. By the time Hung died and the movement dissipated in 1864, it is estimated that nearly 30 million Chinese had died in the conflict to create the kingdom of heavenly peace. Growing friction and expanding violence. Both the Kansas controversy and the Dred Scott decision undermine the democratic commitment to popular sovereignty. Entertaining presidential ambitions, party leader Stephen Douglas sought a solution that might win him both Northern and Southern support in a run for office in 1860. He got his opportunity in a debate with his 1850, or, yeah, 1858 Republican rival for the US Senate, Abraham Lincoln. Born on the Kentucky frontier in 1809, Lincoln had accompanied his family from one field farm to another, picking up schooling in Indiana and Illinois as opportunities arose. As a young man, he worked odd jobs, farm worker, ferryman, surveyor, and store clerk. He was eventually elected to the Illinois legislature and began a serious study of law. 
a strong Whig, Lincoln followed Henry Clay's economic philosophy and steered a middle course between the cotton and conscience wigs of the wings of the Whig party. Lincoln acknowledged that slavery was evil, but contended that it was the unavoidable consequence of black racial inferiority. The only way to get rid of the evil he believed was to prevent its expansion into the territories, forcing it to die out naturally. Douglas's position favoring popular sovereignty flew in the face of Lincoln's designs. And so out of debate in Freeport, Illinois, Lincoln asked Douglas to explain how the people of a territory could exclude slavery in light of the Dred Scott ruling. Douglas's reply became known as the Freeport Doctrine. Slavery, he said, needed the protection of local police regulations. In any territory, citizens opposed to slavery could elect representatives who would, by unfriendly legislation, prevent the introduction of slavery. Basically, slavery can only exist if there's a law saying so. This then would become Douglas's solution as he approached the 1860 election. Northern activists utterly rejected Douglas's compromise and increasingly called for a violent response to the slave power. And in 1857, John Brown came east to oblige them. He convinced several prominent anti-slavery leaders to finance a daring plan to raise an army of slaves in an all out insurrection against their masters. Brown and a small party of followers attacked the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry, Virginia on October 16, 1859, attempting to seize weapons. The arsenal proved an easy target, but no slaves joined the uprising. Local citizens surrounded the arsenal, firing on Brown and his followers until federal troops commanded by Robert E. Lee arrived. On October 18th, Lee's forces battered down the barricaded entrance and arrested Brown. He was tried, convicted of treason, and hanged on December 2nd, 1859. Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry captured the imagination of radical abolitionists. Republican leaders denounced it, but other Northerners proclaimed Brown a martyr. Church bells tolled in many sort of other Northern cities on the day of his execution. Such reactions caused many appalled Southerners, even very moderate ones, to seriously consider secession or withdrawal from the nation. In Alabama, Mississippi, and Florida, state legislatures resolved that a Republican victory in the upcoming presidential election would provide sufficient justification for such action. The Divided Nation. In what ways was the presidential election of 1860 an outcome of the realignment of the party system during the 1850s? And why did the election results have the political effects that they did? The Republicans were a new phenomenon on the American political scene, a purely regional political party. Rather than making any attempt to forge a national coalition, the party drew its strength and ideas almost entirely from the North. The Republican platform, free soil, free labor, and free men, stressed the defilement of white labor by slavery and contended that the slave power conspiracy was eroding the, whites of, the rights of free whites everywhere. By taking up a cry against rum, Romanism, meaning Catholicism, and slavery, the Republicans drew former know-nothings and temperance advocates into their ranks. The Democrats hoped to maintain a national coalition, but as the nation approached a new presidential election, their hopes began to fade. The dominance of regionalism. During the Buchanan administration, Democrats found it increasingly difficult to achieve national party unity. Facing Republican pressure in their own states, Northern Democrats realized that any concession to Southern Democratic demands for extending or protecting slavery would cost them votes at home. In April 1860, as the party convened in Charleston, South Carolina, each side was ready to do battle for its political life. The fight began when Northern supporters of Stephen A. Douglas championed a popular sovereignty position. Southern radicals demanded a plank calling for the legal protection of slavery in the territories. After heated debates, neither side would compromise. When the delegates finally voted, the Douglas forces carried the day. Disgusted delegates from eight Southern states walked out of the convention. Shocked, the remaining delegates adjourned. They would rec uh, reconvene in Baltimore in June. Most Southern delegates boycotted uh, the Baltimore proceedings and Douglas easily won the Democratic presidential nomination with moderate Southerner Herschel V. Johnson of Georgia as his running mate. Hoping to attract moderate voters by, from both the North and the South, the party's final platform supported popular sovereignty and emphasized allegiance to the Union. The Southern Democratic contingent met one week later, also in Baltimore, and they nominated Vice President John C. Breckinridge of Kentucky as its presidential mate, or presidential candidate, and Joseph Lane of Oregon as his running mate. The Southern Democrats' platform vowed support for the Union, but called for federal protection of slavery in the territories and guaranteed preservation of slavery where it already existed. In May 1860, a group of former Whigs and Know-Nothings, along with some disaffected Democrats, convened in Baltimore and formed the Constitutional Union Party. 
They nominated John Bell, a former Southern know-nothing and wealthy slaveholder from Tennessee, and Edward Everett of Massachusetts, a former Whig leader, as his running mate. Hoping to resurrect the politics of compromise, the party resolved to take no stand on the sectional controversy and pledged to uphold the Constitution. Having lost most of its moderates to the Constitutional Union Coalition and having virtually no Southerners in its ranks to start with, the Republican Convention faced few ideological divisions, but personality conflicts were rife. The front runner for the Republican nomination appeared to be William Seward of New York. A former Whig and longtime New York politician, Seward had actively opposed any extension of slavery during the early 1850s, but he had switched to the popular sovereignty position during the Kansas controversy. Several other Republican favorites, Salmon P. Chase of Ohio, Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania, and Edward Bates of Missouri, agreed with Seward's position but sought the nomination for themselves. Eventually, however, Abraham Lincoln emerged as Seward's major competition. Many delegates considered Seward too radical and his campaign manager, Thurlow Weed, was perceived by many as a corrupt opportunist. Lincoln, in contrast, had a reputation for integrity and had not seriously alienated any of the Republican factions. People knew his name from the spot resolutions uh, prior to the war with Mexico. He won the nomination on the third ballot. The election of 1860. The 1860 presidential campaign began as sever several separate contests. Lincoln and Douglas competed for Northern votes. The Republicans were not even on the ballot in the Deep South. Douglas proclaimed himself the only national candidate, but he received most of his support from Northerners who feared the consequences of a Republican victory. By the same token, Breckinridge and the Southern Democrats expected no support in the North. Bell and the Constitutional Unionists attempted to campaign in both regions, but attracted mostly Southern voters anxious to stave off to prevent disunion. Slavery and sectionalism were the key issues. Even moderate Southerners started to believe that the Republicans intended to crush their way of life and to enslave Southern whites economically while freeing Southern blacks. Northern qualms were aroused as well when the pro-Democrat New York Herald contended that the election of Lincoln would bring hundreds of thousands of slaves North to compete with whites for jobs, resulting in African amalgamation with the fair daughters of the Anglo-Saxon, Celtic, and Teutonic races. Seeking to counter such scare tactics, national Republican leaders forged a platform that advocated limits on slavery's expansion, but contained no planks seeking an end to slavery in areas where it already existed. They also called for higher tariffs to appeal to Northern industrialists and for internal improvements and public land legislation to appeal to Westerners. Particularly in the Midwest, party leaders worked hard to portray themselves as the white man's party. These tactics alienated a few abolitionists, but persuaded many Northerners and Westerners to support the party. On November 6th of 1860, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the United States with 180 electoral votes, a clear majority, but only 40% of the popular vote. Lincoln carried all the Northern states, California, and Oregon. Douglas finished second with 29% of the popular vote, but just 12 electoral votes. He won only Missouri. Bell won the 39 electoral votes of Virginia, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Breckenridge, as expected, carried the Deep South, but tallied only 72 electoral votes and 18% of the popular vote nationwide. For the first time in American history, a purely regional party held the presidency. The Republicans, who had made no effort to win votes in the South, also swept congressional races in the North and secured a large majority in the House of Representatives for the upcoming term. The first wave of secession. After the Republican victory, Southern sentiment for uh, secession snowballed, especially in the Deep South. The Republicans were a party founded on a single sentiment, stated the Richmond Examiner, hatred of African slavery. The New Orleans Delta agreed, calling the Republicans essentially a revolutionary party. But this party now controlled the national government. To a growing number of Southerners, the Republican victory was proof that secession was the only alternative to political domination. Most Republicans did not believe that the South would actually leave the Union. Seward had ridiculed threats of secession and Lincoln believed that the people of the South had too much sense to launch an attempt to ruin the government. During the campaign, he had promised no interference by the government with slaves or slavery within the states and he continued to urge moderation. In a last ditch attempt at compromise, John J. Crittenden proposed a block of constitutional amendments on December 18, 1860. These called for extending the Missouri Compromise Line westward across the continent, forbidding slavery north of the line, and protecting slavery to the south. 
maintaining the interstate slave trade, and requiring federal compensation to slave owners who were unable to recover fugitive slaves from northern states. Surprisingly, this plan appealed to some northerners, especially businessmen who feared that secession would cause a major depression. Lincoln warned, however, that such a plan would lose us everything we gained by the election. The Senate defeated Crittenden's proposal by a vote of just 25 to 23. Meanwhile, on December 20th of 1860, delegates in South Carolina met to consider seceding from the Union. South Carolina had long been a hotbed of resistance to federal authority, uh, throwing it back to the tariff of abominations and the nullification crisis under Jackson. Um, Let's see. Amid general jubilation, South Carolina delegates voted unanimously to dissolve their ties with the United States. Just as the fire eaters hoped, fire eaters, by the way, are, um, it's a nickname given to Southerners who were particularly vocal and active in supporting secession. Just as the fire eaters hoped, other Southern states soon followed. During January of 1861, delegates convened in Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana and voted to secede. Meanwhile, in Texas, which had been holding back, secessionists rejected unionist pleas from Governor Sam Houston and opted to join the neighboring Louisiana in rebellion. The Confederacy now numbered seven states. On February 4, 1861, delegates from the seven seceding states and from several states still considering secession met in Montgomery, Alabama and formed the Confederate States of America. During the several, we several weeks that followed, the Provisional Congress drafted a constitution and the Confederate States ratified it on March 11, 1861. The Confederate Constitution emphasized the sovereign and independent character of the states and guaranteed the protection of slavery in any new territories acquired. It allowed tariffs solely for the purpose of raising government revenue and prohibited government funding of internal improvements. Internal improvements, by the way, are things like roads, railroads, canals, things that would improve uh, sort of the internal workings of our country. It also limited the president and vice president to a single six-year term. A cabinet composed of six executive department heads rounded out the executive branch. In all other respects, the Confederate government was identical to that in the United States. In fact, the U.S. Constitution was acknowledged as the supreme law in the Confederacy, except in those particulars where it conflicted with provisions in the Confederate Constitution. Responses to disunion. Even as late as March of 1861, a significant number of Southerners did not favor secession. John Bell and Stephen Douglas together had received more than 50% of Southern votes in 1860, winning support from Southerners who desired compromise. These plain folk joined together with some large planters who stood to suffer economic loss from disunion and calls for moderation and compromise. In the border states, which were less invested in cotton and had numerous ties with the North, were not strongly inclined towards secession. In February, Virginia had called for a peace conference to meet in Washington in an effort to forestall hostilities. Force, yeah, forestall hostilities. But this attempt, like Crittenden's effort, also failed to hold the Union together. The division in Southern sentiments was a major stumbling block to the election of a Confederate president. Many moderate delegates to the Constitutional Convention refused to support fire eaters, believing them to be equally responsible with the Republicans for initiating the crisis. The convention remained deadlocked until two pro-secession Virginia attendees nominated Mississippi moderate Jefferson Davis as a compromise candidate. Davis appeared to be the ideal choice. A West Point graduate, he served during the war with Mexico, was elected to the Senate soon afterward, uh, then left the Senate in 1851 to run unsuccessfully for governor in Mississippi. After serving as Secretary of War under Franklin Pierce, he returned to the Senate in 1857. Although Davis had long championed Southern interests and owned many slaves, he was, um, he was no romantic fire eater. When he had fought for a Southern route for a transcontinental railroad, he believed that it would benefit the South economically, but he also felt that it would tie the whole nation more firmly together. Like many of his contemporaries, however, Davis had become increasingly alarmed by the prospect of declining Southern political power. Immediately after Mississippi's declaration of secession, Davis resigned his Senate seat and threw in with the Confederacy. To moderates like Davis, the presidential election of 1860 was simply a forceful demonstration that unless the South took a strong stand against outside interference, the region would no longer be able to control its own internal affairs. The initial northward tilt in the Senate created by California's admission in 1850 had been aggravated in 1858 by the admission of Minnesota and by Oregon's statehood in 1859. Southerners, Davis believed, needed to act in concert to convince Northerners to either leave the South alone or to face the region's withdrawal from the nation. 
elected provisional president of the Confederate States of America unanimously on February 9th, 1861, Davis addressed the cheering crowds in Montgomery a week later and set forth the Confederate position. The time for compromise has now passed, he said. The South is determined to maintain her position and make all who oppose her smell Southern power and feel Southern steel. In his inaugural address several days later, he stressed a desire for peace, but reiterated, repeated, that the courage and patriotism of the Confederate States would be found equal to any measure of defense which honor and security may require. Northern Democrats and Republicans alike watched developments in the South with dismay. President Buchanan argued that secession had no constitutional validity and that any state leaving the Union did so unlawfully, but he also asserted that the federal government had no constitutional power to coerce a state to remain in the Union. He blamed the crisis on incessant and violent agitation on the slavery question, chiding Northerners for disregarding fugitive slave laws and calling for a constitutional amendment protecting slavery. Waiting to assume the office he had just won, Lincoln wrestled with the twin problems of what he would do about secession and slavery. On one hand, he directly opposed Buchanan's position, stating that my opinion is that no state can in any way lawfully get out of the union without the consent of the others. But he was more moderate where slavery was concerned, writing to reassure Southerners that a Republican administration would not directly or indirectly interfere with their slaves or with them about their slaves. Before he could do anything else, Lincoln first had to unite his party. In an attempt to appease all the Republican factions, he chose his cabinet with great care. His vice president, Hannibal Hamlin of Maine, had supported Lincoln, but was also a friend of William Seward and had been chosen to balance the ticket factionally. Lincoln continued this balancing act with cabinet appointments for his four main rivals for nomination. Seward received the job of Secretary of State. Edward Bates of Missouri became Attorney General and Simon Cameron of Pennsylvania, Secretary of War. Sam and P. Chase of Ohio became Secretary of the Treasury. Despite Lincoln's even-handedness, his political balancing act was not easy to maintain. Chase and Seward, for instance, had a long history of political infighting and they hated each other. The nation dissolved. Considering the questions, what problems confronted Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis in March of 1861? And how did their actions contribute to the escalating national crisis? Abraham Lincoln was inaugurated on March 4th of 1861. In his inaugural address, he repeated themes that he'd been stressing since the election, no interference with slavery in states where it existed, no extension of slavery into the territories, and no tolerance of secession. Lincoln believed that the nation remained unbroken, and he pledged to see that the laws of the Union be faithfully executed in all the states. This policy, he continued, necessitated no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none unless it is forced upon the national authority. If war came, he argued, it would be over secession, not slavery, for the federal government had a duty to maintain the union by any means, including force. Lincoln, Sumter, and war. Lincoln's first presidential address drew mixed reactions. Most Republicans found it firm and reasonable, applauding its tone. Union advocates in both the North and the South thought the speech held a promise for the future. Even former rival Stephen Douglas stated, I am with him. Moderate Southerners commended Lincoln's temperance and conservatism and believed the speech was, uh, was all any reasonable Southern man could have expected. Confederates and their sympathizers, however, branded the speech a declaration of war. But war was brewing even before Lincoln assumed office. In December of 1860, South Carolina officials ordered the state militia to seize two federal forts, Fort Moultrie and Castle Pinckney, and the federal arsenal at Charleston. In response, Major Robert Anderson removed all federal troops from Charleston to Fort Sumter, an island stronghold in Charleston Harbor. The Confederate Congress demanded that President Buchanan remove all federal troops from the sovereign territory of the Confederacy. Despite his sympathy for the Southern cause, Buchanan announced that Fort Sumter would be defended against all hostile attacks from whatever quarter. On January 9th of 1861, a Charleston Harbor battery fired upon a supply ship as it attempted to reach the fort. Buchanan denounced the action, but did nothing. Immediately after taking office in March, Lincoln received a report from Fort Sumter that supplies were running low. Under great pressure from Northern public opinion to do something, to do something more than President Buchanan before him had done, he responded cleverly. He informed South Carolina Governor Francis Pickens of his peaceful intentions to send unarmed boats carrying food and supplies to the besieged fort. Lincoln thus placed the Confederacy in a no-win position, either allow the fort to be resupplied or fire upon an unarmed ship, which would be sufficiently dishonorable to justify stronger federal action. After studying the situation, Confederate officials determined to beat Lincoln to the punch. 
President Davis ordered the Confederate commander at Charleston, General P.G.T. Beauregard, to demand the evacuation of Sumter and, if the Federals refused, to proceed in such a manner as you may determine to reduce it. On April 11th, while the supply ships were still on their way, Beauregard called on Anderson to surrender. When Anderson rejected the ultimatum, shore batteries opened fire. After a 34-hour artillery battle, Anderson surrendered. Neither side had inflicted casualties on the other, but civil war had officially begun. Across the North, newspapers contrasted the president's resolute but restrained policy with the violent aggression of the Confederates, and the public rallied behind the Union cause. In New York City, where Southern sympathizers had once vehemently criticized abolitionist actions, a million people attended a Union rally. Even Northern Democrats rallied behind the Republican president, hearkening to Stephen Douglas' statement that there can be no neutrals in this war, only patriots or traitors. Spurred by the public outcry and confident of support, Lincoln called for 75,000 militiamen to be mobilized to maintain the honor, the integrity, and the existence of our national union and the perpetuity of popular government. Northern states responded immediately and enthusiastically. Across the Upper South and the border regions, however, the call to arms meant that a decision had to be made, whether to continue in the Union or to join the Confederacy. Choosing sides in Virginia. The need for Southern unity in the face of what he saw as Northern aggression pushed Jefferson Davis to employ a combination of political finesse and force to create a solid Southern alignment. He selected his cabinet with this in mind, choosing one cabinet member from each state except his own Mississippi and appointing men of varying degrees of radicalism. But unity among the seven seceding states was only one of Davis's worries. A more pressing concern was alignment among the eight slave states that remained in the Union. These states were critical for they contained more than half the entire Southern population, two thirds of its white population, possessed most of the South's industrial capacity, produced most of its food and raised more than half of its horses. In addition, many experienced and able military leaders lived in these states. If the Confederacy was to have any chance of survival, the human and physical resources of the whole South were essential. It was not Davis's appeal for solidarity, but Lincoln's call to mobilize the militia that won most of the other slave states for the Confederate cause. In Virginia, Governor John Letcher refused to honor Lincoln's demand for troops, and on April 17th, the special convention declared for, uh, for secession. Voters in Virginia overwhelmingly ratified this decision in a popular referendum on May 23rd. By then, Letcher had offered Richmond as a site for the new nation's capital. The Confederate Congress accepted the offer in order to strengthen its ties with Virginia. Not all Virginians were flattered at becoming the seat for the Confederacy. Residents of the western portion of the state had strong union ties and long-standing political differences with their neighbors east of the Allegheny Mountains. 46 counties called mass unionist meetings to protest the state's secession, and in a June convention at Wheeling, they elected their own governor, Francis H. Piermont, and drew up a constitution. In May of 1862, the West Virginia legislature convened and requested admission to the United States. For many individuals in the Upper South, the decision to support the Confederacy was not an easy one. Virginian Robert E. Lee, for example, was deeply devoted to the Union. A West Point graduate and a career officer in the US Army, he had a distinguished record in the war with Mexico and as superintendent of West Point. General Winfield Scott, commander of the Union forces, called Lee the best soldier I ever saw in the field. Recognizing his military skill, Lincoln offered Lee field command of the Union armies, but the Virginian refused, deciding that he should serve his native state instead. Lee agonized over the decision, but told a friend, I cannot raise my hand against my birthplace, my home, my children. He resigned his U.S. Army commission in April of 1861. When he informed Scott, a personal friend and fellow Virginian, of his decision, Scott replied, you have made the greatest mistake of your life, but I feared it would be so. Scott chose to remain loyal to the Union. A second wave of secession. Influenced by Virginia, three other states joined the Confederacy. Arkansas had voted against secession in March, hoping that bloodshed might be averted. But when Lincoln called for militia units, Governor Henry M. Rector answered, none will be furnished. The demand is only adding insult to injury. The state then called a second convention and on May 6th, they seceded from the Union. North Carolinians had also hoped for compromise, but moderates turned secessionist when Secretary of War Simon Cameron requisitioned, uh, which means to demand for military use, two regiments of militia for immediate service against the Confederacy. Governor John W. Ellis replied, I regard the levy of troops made by this administration for the purpose of subjugating the states of the South to be in violation of the Constitution and a gross usurpation of power. 
North Carolina seceded on May 20th following, um, following Arkansas. Tennessee, the 11th and final state to join the Confederacy, was the home of many moderates, including John Bell, the Constitutional Union candidate in 1860. Eastern residents favored the Union, but those in the West favored the Confederacy. The state's voters at first rejected this union overwhelmingly, but after the fighting began, Governor Isham C. Harris and the state legislature initiated military ties with the Confederacy, forcing another vote on the issue. Western voters carried the election, approving the agreement and seceding from the union on June 8th. East Tennesseans, who remained loyal unionists, tried to divide the state like West Virginians had done, but Davis ordered Confederate troops to occupy the region, thwarting the effort. Trouble in the border states. Four slave states remained in the Union, and the start of hostilities brought political and military confrontations in three of these four border states. Delaware quietly stayed in the Union. Voters there had favored Breckenridge in 1860, but the majority of voters disapproved of secession, and few of the state's citizens owned slaves. Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky, the other three border states, however, each contained large vocal secessionist factions and they appeared poised to bolt to the Confederacy. Maryland was particularly vital to the Union for it and closed Washington, D.C. on the three sides not bordered by Virginia. Maryland's significance became apparent on April 6, 1861, when a Massachusetts regiment responding to Lincoln's calls for troops passed through Baltimore on the way to the Capitol. A mob confronted the soldiers, attacking them with bricks, bottles, and pistols. The soldiers returned fire. When the violence subsided, 12 Baltimore residents and four soldiers lay dead, and dozens more were wounded. Secessionists reacted violently, destroying railroad bridges to keep additional northern troops out of the state. In effect, Washington, D.C. was cut off from the north. Lincoln and General Scott ordered, ordered the military occupation of Baltimore and declared martial law, much as Davis had done in eastern Tennessee. The state legislature finally met and voted to remain neutral. Lincoln then instructed the army to arrest suspected Southern sympathizers and hold them without formal hearings or charges. With Southern sympathizers suppressed, new state elections were held. The new legislature, overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly unionist, voted against secession. Kentucky had important economic ties to the South, but was strongly nationalistic. The governor refused to honor Lincoln's call for troops, but the state legislature voted to remain neutral. Both the North and the South honored that neutrality. Kentucky's own militia, however, split into two factions, and the state became a leading example of bloody fighting among members of the same family, kind of like Kansas. In Missouri, Governor Claiborne F. Jackson, a former pro-slavery activist in Kansas, pushed for secession, arguing that Missourians were bound together in one brotherhood with the states of the South. When Unionists frustrated the secession movement, Jackson's forces seized the federal arsenal at Liberty and wrote to Jefferson Davis requesting artillery to support an assault on the arsenal at St. Louis. Union sympathizers, however, fielded their own forces and fought Jackson at every turn. Rioting broke out in St. Louis as civilians clashed with soldiers and mob violence marred the Knights. Jackson's secessionist movement sent representatives to the Confederate Congress in Richmond, but Union forces maintained nominal control of the state and drove pro-Southern leaders into exile. To go back to page 333, it matters today, ex part Merriman. On May 25th, 1861, a Maryland state militiaman named John Merriman was arrested by federal troops and charged with treason as the result of alleged pro-Confederate activities. Merriman's attorney immediately filed for a writ of habeas corpus, demanding that the government show just cause for detaining him. General George Cadwallader, the commander of the fort where Merriman was being held, responded that by order of the President of the United States, he had suspended Merriman's habeas corpus rights. In a lengthy legal opinion, Chief Justice Roger Taney ruled that because the section of the Constitution stating that the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus may be suspended in cases of rebellion or invasion was in Article I, which enumerates the powers of Congress, that only Congress, and not the president or a military officer, could suspend habeas corpus. Today, the question of whether, or under what circumstances, limitations on habeas corpus protections can be applied to both citizens and non-citizens is a particularly important issue in the struggle against both foreign and domestic terrorism, and a number of recent cases have had to review ex part Merriman as these questions have arisen. If you want, you can consider the questions. How does, or excuse me, does it seem that Taney's decision was the right one under the circumstances? How might you argue against it? And take a look at a recent military detention case like Hamden v. Rumsfeld or perhaps Hamden v. Rumsfeld 
oh, that is this, oh, Hamdi versus Rumsfeld or Hamdan versus Rumsfeld and analyze to what extent that decision parallels ex part Merriman. Individual voices, Frederick Douglass, what to the slave is the 4th of July? Oppositional language and shocking rhetoric played a leading role in the 20th century civil rights movement. Examin examining historical documents reveals that this was not a new phenomenon. Credible because of his own experience, Frederick Douglass became a very effective speaker for the abolition cause, often by shocking audiences. The following passage from an 1852 Fourth of July address to the Ladies Anti-Slavery Society of Rochester illustrates Douglass's use of such rhetoric. Fellow citizens, pardon me, allow me to ask, why am I called upon to speak here today? What have I, or those I represent, to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? And am I, therefore, called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence to us? But such is not the state of the case. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought forth life and heal healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. Fellow citizens, above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with the popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. Summary. Throughout the 1840s, slavery became increasingly politicized. The war with Mexico that began in 1846 raised, and then the Compromise of 1850 failed to alleviate, regional tension and debates. The Whig Party, constrained or strained by fragmentation among its factions, disintegrated, and two completely new groups, the Know Nothings and the Republicans, competed to replace it. A series of events, including the Kansas Nebraska Act and the Dred Scott decision, intensified regional polarization, and radicals on both sides fanned the flames of sectional rivalry. Even the Democratic Party could not hold together, splitting into northern and southern wings. By 1859, the Young Republican Party, committed to restricting slavery's expansion, seemed poised to gain control of the federal government. Fearing that the loss of political power would doom their way of life, Southerners recoiled in terror. Neither side felt it could afford to back down. With the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, seven Southern states withdrew from the Union. Last-minute efforts at compromise failed, and on April 12, 1861, five weeks after Lincoln's inauguration, Confederate forces fired on federal troops at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor. Lincoln believed that he had to call the nation to arms, and this move forced wavering states to choose sides. Internal divisions in Virginia, Tennessee, Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri brought further violence and military action. Before summer, a second wave of secession finally solidified the lineup and established the boundary lines between the two competing societies. The stakes were set, the division was complete. The nation was poised for the bloodiest war in its history.